I think when Roland was referring to an opportunity for law reform, he had very much in mind that driving power for saving new in the pantheon of uh, power brokers for protecting the environment who's able to move in and adjust the law to protect our forests, Peter Garrett. And so um, I'm sure he's going to say this. I did notice a press release from him during the week in which he stated how pleased he was that the international authorities looking at what the logging in Tasmania had confidence that the logging in the forest of Tasmania was okay. Anyway, um, we had a cart, which was the law. We had a team, which was the witnesses and the lawyers to, and, and neighbours to uh, moving to protect the Wailanka forest and the three endangered species. But we needed direction and we needed a teamster, Margaret Blakers. <laughs> which I hope you've all got a copy of, so all those groups that, that Bob just mentioned, the witnesses, a couple of whom are here tonight, I think, Sophie in particular, I can see, um, and the, the legal team who were just brilliant. We were very lucky to have such a harmonious team that could, could really take this case as far as we could possibly have pushed it. Uh, it was three years from the moment we got into the court until a few weeks ago when we were turfed out unceremoniously in the High Court. Um, only on a two to one decision though. If uh, Justice Kirby, Michael Kirby, had had his way, we would have been in the High Court now in a case that would have been as important as the Franklin case 20 years ago, 25 years ago. 25 years ago. Um, but that's not going to happen. We've been turfed out and I think it'll be some time before a similar case can make its way through the processes to have another go. But I actually do have a case in mind, so... And I think others should look at this. <laughs> others should look at this. The courts are not just for them, they're for us as well. And we should actually be a lot more proactive about taking legal action. But leaving that to one side for the moment, because I don't think there's probably much further we can go on that with Wylanka. I think what the case did, apart from making it really clear that RFA's regional forest agreements are not worth the paper they're written on in terms of protecting the environment, um, and that the Commonwealth and, and the, the role, the lack of role that the Commonwealth can now play, what it's done is stop logging in my lecture for three years. And in that three years, the wheel has turned. And we're now in a climate change world where everybody is worried about what's going to happen and where we are now actively looking at what we're going to do about it. And one of the critical things that we need to do about climate change is protect forests and woodlands. Stop clearing, stop logging. It's really simple. Um, if you divide the carbon world into fossil carbon, which comes from coal and oil and all of that, and what I'm calling biocarbon, the carbon that sits on the surface of the earth and vegetation and soils and so on. We need to look at biocarbon as a separate issue. And there are significant emissions, like 20 to 30 percent of Australia's greenhouse gas emissions are biocarbon emissions. And you don't see that figure and you don't see that, uh, that reality put in front of you very often because the way that the accounts are presented, it's all netted out. So anything which grows is used to balance off the emissions from logging and clearing. But that's not the point. The point is the emissions. The point is the clearing. And biocarbon is stored, not like coal, which is underground, over there somewhere out of sight. And therefore, if you stop uh, digging it up, then it just sits there. It doesn't get in the way. But biocarbon occupies space on the surface of the planet. And space is limiting. Water is limiting. There is not enough space to store all the carbon that we need to on the surface of the earth. And that means, just quite simply, quite uh, arithmetically, that you need to protect the places which have the densest stores of carbon. Where are the densest stores of carbon? They're in native vegetation. 
native vegetation which has been accumulating carbon over decades and centuries. And there's recent work from the ANU which shows that um, the amount of carbon, astonishing amounts of carbon stored in native forests, up to two and a half thousand cubic, uh, tons of carbon per hectare, which is about 9,000 tons of carbon dioxide. Um, so 100 hectares of that kind of forest would have a million tonnes of, carb of carbon dioxide stored. And to put that into a context, Australia's total emissions of carbon dioxide annually are about 550 million tonnes. So something not much more than a standard logging coop, 1% of Australia's carbon emissions, CO2 emissions. So protecting all existing native vegetation, forests, woodlands, rangelands, grasslands, becomes critically important. And the protection of those natural vegetation is, um, because, because it is an ecosystem, it functions in a way that enables it to adapt and to look after itself pretty much over time. So that what you have by protecting natural systems is permanent protection. And permanent protection is what's required for climate protection. So biodiversity, which is the ecosystem, which is the, the functioning living system, becomes a centrally important element in tackling climate change in Australia and globally. So from here on in, that debate is going to become a really, really important one. And for the Greens, it's a, it's a crucial one. And we're probably the only ones who are going to be really pursuing it. Uh, as, as it needs to be. But within the next few weeks, you'll start to see biocarbon or green carbon being talked about much more than it has been in the past. And just on that front, Garno, Professor Garno's review, having spent, <coughs> what, two years or so working on, on climate change, he's left this whole sector, this whole biocarbon question to be dealt with in the next two or three weeks. And that's just symptomatic of the problem of not enough focus. It's 30% of the emissions, it ought to be 30% of the money, 30% of the resources, 30% of everything ought to be going into this particular sector. So that's, that's our, our, the next phase of this fight on, a, on an Australia-wide level and on a global level. But bringing it back to Wailangta, I think there's two other things we need to do. One is there is a very fine local group who are getting organised to uh, protect Wailangta. And maybe could people from that group stand up? I can see Sharon. <laughs> Thank you. 